Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the Dun & Bradstreet uh, webinar today on turning compliance into a serious competitive advantage for your organization. Um, uh, my name is Avinash Gupta. Um, I am uh, based in Bombay and the CEO of our business here. And I'm joined by my colleague, Alun Singh, who's our global chief economist uh, and also based in Bombay. Uh, we are having a fairly uh, nice and rainy day in Bombay today, so I guess it gives us good tidings. But uh, most importantly, I hope everybody's keeping safe and well, and hopefully in some ways we've seen a little bit of uh, the back of the second wave, uh, and hopefully we're better prepared for the third wave. So just a quick, thing, couple of quick introductions from me, and then you know yeah, we'll walk. Karun will walk through the the study and the findings, which I'm sure will be all very interesting to all of you. Uh, Dun and Bradstreet, uh, for some of you who don't know us too well, we've been around for a long time, That's nearly 170 odd years. Uh, we are a global firm. We listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And our business is to uh, carry, we are the biggest carriers of B2B data globally, and uh, our business is to really use that data to provide insights which I make uh, easier for businesses to manage the risk, uh, manage the compliance, manage the customers, manage the supply networks, uh, along with the analytics which we are able to provide on the data we hold. So uh, we've been doing a number of these uh, webinars on various uh, Things we had picked out by uh, talking to our clients and the wider sample across the country. Uh, today's is very much focused on the compliance side and very focused towards the chief compliance officers. So, hope you find it helpful. We'll try to wrap up our uh, uh, talking uh, and then we'll be open to, I guess, question and answers um, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's needed uh, uh, towards the end. So, please have, uh, and I'm sure my colleague Noina who I think I interrupted, maybe she was going to open it up, but uh, apologies for that. In terms of any question answers, uh, uh, please do please do keep them with you and uh, hope to talk them towards that. So I don't know if I can move to the first slide um, in terms of uh, our slide deck. Uh, you know, in all the, as uh, I don't will walk you through the study, but clearly in all the conversations we have uh, with compliance teams uh, and the work we do with them across the globe, we find that there are four factors which are shaping today's uh, competitive environment. To remain competitive, leaders must definitely do these four things and maybe other things on top of it. One obviously is to reduce cost. I think that's uh, relevant for just about everything in anybody in today's world, but really, really maintaining uh, the right set of standard of compliance uh, at the right cost is, uh, is clearly a competitive advantage. Uh, you know, third party risk and compliance programs are challenged with you know, out of date data across many varied and disparate systems, and that clearly is a challenge. The processes used are very manually intensive and have equally skyrocketing costs associated with them. And, you know, and maybe in the Indian context, uh, this comes on top of uh, with all the resistance which a lot of you know, large companies find in terms of, you know, uh, the compliance programs they have to run for the ecosystem. We were just talking this morning to a large pharmaceutical player, and you know it's it's uh, for whom we do. Uh, Dun & Bradstreet does approximately checks on thousand of the customers. Uh, you know, it's quite a challenge in terms of uh, of uh, the MNC to effectively you know ask its customers to provide that kind of detail uh, and of information, not only the detail, but in a very tight time frame as well. So I think, you know, the cost obviously adds up because all that takes time to pull together, analyze, collect um, on top of all the manual processes and the disparate systems. The second thing, if I can touch upon, is obviously managing risk. You know, um, you know, we do live, uh, we try our best to not live in a silo world, but uh, many of us do live in siloed worlds. And in a siloed decision making, which comes across with that, and processing uh, and processes make managing risk across many organizations a huge challenge, especially the large ones. In addition to internal disconnect between various departments, compliance organizations are faced with the expectation to mitigate risk with a high reliance on self disclosures, the inability to develop a risk based approach, and lack of monitoring and uh, changing and, and alerting everybody for change management. 
So I think managing risk clearly is, is a competitive advantage, which we all can see and uh, observe in more so in today's environment. Uh, for the last 14 months or so, uh, folks who managed to navigate that risk in the environment have clearly come out far ahead and will continue to prosper. There will be an alpha to be had for managing risk in this uh, environment much more closely and better. The third competitive advantage obviously is also accelerating the process of due diligence. We've all seen it in our uh, employers internally, externally. Onboarding a new supplier, customer or third party can sometimes take much longer, definitely in many cases months. The need to accelerate the due diligence process is imperative. However, for compliance team, it is just not about doing it faster. It is about accelerating due diligence with the auditable, accurate program that allows for deeper due diligence when needed. Again, maybe if I can give a very topical example, you know, we are we are living in the COVID world. Uh, there is a lot of talk about vaccines, for vaccine manufacturers being able to provide vaccines to India, both domestically and you know international suppliers. So clearly there is a lot of uh, work which we do with large pharma players, small pharma players around that side. And clearly there is a huge rush in terms of getting that vaccine supply chain you know, vetted, uh, onboarded, um, you know, checked. And clearly there is a timeline to be followed, but again, that needs to be done with all the right kind of checks and balances. And it's not easy if you don't have the right systems, the right data, the right processes in place. And moving to the last one, really, in terms of, you know, very important to protect the brand and the reputation which you have built up in many cases, like in Dun Bradstreet, 170 years. Uh, equally, there are companies older than us as well who have bigger brands to protect, bigger reputations to protect, and uh, which have been built over very slowly over long periods of time. So clearly, while there are fines for non-compliance, and these can be quite steep, I'll touch upon that maybe in one of the slides uh, just after this, uh, so can the negative impact to a company's brand and reputation. There is a responsibility for each one of us as employees, as shareholders, as stakeholders, to ensure that our suppliers, customers, and third parties align to the values of our company. And that's very relevant to all of us. And, you know, just taking an example again, uh, it's quite interesting that, you know, the, the level of impact is becoming a lot shorter. So, for example, if you follow uh, some of the crises and the, uh, you know, which happened, for example, in the garment industry, you have a large manufacturing factory burn down or have a fire or catch a fire in Bangladesh and the stock price of the ultimate customer in the listed stock market in the Western world drops 10, 20, 20%. Because customers are becoming very, very uh, aware and very um, aligned to really the interests of the entire ecosystem. So it's not that you know you can have a, uh, somebody in your supply chain uh, who's not doing the right thing, not building the right kind of facility, not treating employees properly, child labor, and it not having an impact not only on a monetary share price, stakeholder value, but also in terms of the reputation. Of the brand. So I think it's uh, it's uh, it's very important, and you know this 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 is a quick summary in terms of you know setting the stage for some of the conversation and discussion later. Moving to the next slide, clearly we all live in a very, very uh, highly regulated and controlled world. Uh, there is a tidal wave of regulations governing how businesses conduct commerce and partner with others in the ecosystem. It's getting more and more uh, tightly controlled, if I can call it so. Uh, as we are seeing, you know, with some of the stuff which is playing out between you know, big tech, big data, and, and governments as well. So it's it's becoming even more and more important. The number of regulations uh, one has to hop over and look through are increasing. So for so since, for example, since in this century, since uh, 2000, uh, the number of regulations enacted are uh, already more than uh, you know 100% of what was enacted in the entire previous century. So I guess the job of a compliance officer the importance of compliance is just going to get even more and more difficult and more and more important. So while some companies are adequately resourced to design programs and provide the right type of compliance and training for employees, third parties, um, as I was referring to the conversation this morning, which we had with the client, 
enforcing compliance at scale is a much more difficult and in many cases a near impossible task. And that's where I think when we talk about the study, uh, you could you could kind of get a sense of how technology possibly is is a solution provider for that. Um, the, the 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 challenges on getting things wrong, obviously, you know, we know the fines and the settlement which people have to pay. And 2020 was a record year for the FCPA, as we call it, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act settlement amount. Um, an increasingly regulatory vigor and scrutiny by consumers, shareholders, and activists makes the case to improve corporate transparency even more stronger. And uh, I referred back to the example of the garment industry and the entire ecosystem getting impacted. Uh, the weakest link is the problem. And really, how do you design processes and systems to protect the weakest link is always a challenge in a global ecosystem. While all these responsibilities fall squarely on the shoulders of the chief compliance officer, CCO, uh, these are only a part of a modern CCO's job, as we all know. CCOs also need to proactively manage a host of rapidly emerging risks created by societal, environmental, and technological challenges. So this they need to get right, among all the other many other things which they need to manage in their ecosystem. This results in the need for companies to figure out how to best use data, in insights from that data, which is the most important thing, to meet the challenges which I just described. Trusted data, dependent analytics, and solutions that scale are critical for businesses to remain competitive, which is what we'll just talk about in, the, in, the, in terms of our study as well. Moving to the next slide, uh, as uh, I was saying, you know, getting the data and the analytics is very right. Uh, you know, as I was saying, we are the biggest providers of uh, keepers of B2B data globally, uh, and obviously keeping that current uh, rather than static is very important. Um, and uh, and in terms of working with data is not always straightforward. Uh, because of the rapid change in data, it's uh, very overwhelming because the amount of data being captured is quite uh, vast and it's clearly constant. So for example, you know, we've got this uh, uh, we've got this, uh, some of the example here in terms of the North American market. In the next hour, I guess the hour which we'll be talking, uh, there are 190 approximately close to 200 business addresses which will change. Um, approximately 300 CO changes will happen in the next one hour. Uh, 90 companies will change the names and 12 businesses will file for bankruptcy. So just to give you a magnitude of the amount of change and when you look at that across 450 million plus entities which we have in our B2B database, you can just imagine the scale of uh, change and constant updation of data which is required. And that becomes relevant for you as, uh, as people in compliance and trying to keep everybody's ecosystem clean. With the rate of data change, supply verification and compliance can be difficult or quickly become out of date. Vendor master files change rapidly, supply verification and compliance will quickly be out of date, if not a top priority, to make constant and consistent updates, which is what we tell our clients, you know, uh, uh, do your updation, take the current data when you're doing the analysis, take the current scores when you're doing the analysis. Businesses will need a single source of truth across functions to make better, more accurate, timely decisions, um, as I was just mentioning. And I think this is where both uh, technology comes in and also our own thing. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Arun Singh in terms of uh, talking of uh, some of the findings from the study, and then both of us will come back and take some questions at the end and your comments as well. Just before I do that, uh, just talking about updation. Uh, yesterday uh, I was talking to somebody who's uh, who's a very senior person in the in the financial world in India. He's on a couple of very prominent boards, and he actually called me saying that you know. Uh, on one of the boards where he's a member, uh, the, uh, the company had got checks done on the board members and against his name, whoever's done that work has assigned him as a PEP, which is a politically exposed uh, person. And he's by no sense a PEP, but you know, somewhere in some photograph or uh, many years ago or some something which they pulled up and that criteria has been used to, to define him as a PEP and he's having to do a lot of explaining around it. So just, just to demonstrate that you know, having the data right makes things better. Uh, having your uh, 
uh, analytics right on the data makes things better, but it's never perfect. So let, let me with, with that example uh, again. Good to have you here. Uh, look forward to the Q&A and I'll hand over to Arun now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Aminash, for such a wonderful insight and that is so timely that we all know that compliance is very critical and very important function of the company, especially during the crisis and the pandemic was the crisis of you know once in a century. In fact, even first time 1925 crisis was basically not of that scale where almost 200 countries got impacted in that our vendor supplier entire ecosystem got challenged. Keeping that objective in the mind uh, in end of 2020, we reached out to uh, chief compliance officers of something around 250 businesses. Uh, the annual revenue was more than 500 crore for each of those 250, uh, 250 businesses and they were spread across BFSI sectors, IT, ITS, manufacturing. In fact, within manufacturing, most of the critical manufacturing sectors were covered and other industries from rest of the sector, which is not part of what you call classified limelight or classified front ended industry uh, market. Uh, cities covered pretty much all almost all the big cities, you know, six, seven cities we covered uh, largely focused toward the Mumbai and Delhi. And uh, and, and basically just wanted to bring out whole story from the India across various sectors and 250 businesses size is good uh, sample and for the large uh, corporate in India. What basically we tried to um, you know, find answer um, of three broad level concerns and the questions. One, the top risk and challenges faced by businesses during the pandemic, as I said that each and every crisis have triggered the compliance challenges, the compliance issue. So we just wanted to find out what are the basically top risk and challenges among the CEO, the CCOs uh, community. Second, during the pandemic or the post pandemic, what are expectations about the trends in the misconducts and frauds during the pandemic? You know, I mean, I just touched, um, give multiple examples with basically highlighting the concerns toward the compliance and the related issues. The third, the current compliance management practices and the role of technology that we know we all know that technology is basically fast forwarding most of our business uh, opportunities and minimizing the risk and you know and, and the related framework so many many companies across the board across the functions are taking a help of new age technology and i think uh, this this group, this persona is no uh, outlier. They're very much part of this one. In fact, all of us are part of industry four and thinking about industry five, uh, industry revolution. Now with that, this was basically the methodology. This was basically the intention for us uh, and, in, in, and to reach out to the CCO community to understand what they feel. Now, I would basically talk about some of those uh, findings, what we got from each of you, uh, you know, as a part of uh, the survey and the wider outside this group, what you're basically feeling and what you're basically expecting during the pandemic and the post pandemic. Two in three chief compliance officers, you know, find the economic risk to be the most challenging in the current environment. Something around 75 percent is coming out, uh, you know, slightly less than 75, now slightly less than 70 percent of the people are saying that. The economic risk is very, uh, you know, very high and in fact, elevated during the pandemic is likely to be followed by the technology at something around 50% of the chief compliance office have said this one. Now, that was risk categories. Now, second, what is the top concerns faced, uh, you know, faced by chief compliance officers? Now, one in two, almost 50%, there are many top uh, concerns uh, what we can highlight, but we basically focused only on the three top categories uh, where something around 50% every second person uh, from the chief compliance officer community are facing those challenges. One, preventing fraud effectively. So more than 50% of the you know, uh, chief compliance officers, a surveyed chief compliance officer have expressed those concerns. Uh, 
and in, in fact, it, it's very difficult to prevent fraud effectively. So roughly around say 46, 50 percent, one can say that ensuring that all policies are followed strictly uh, within uh, company and with the entire ecosystem of vendor and the customer side. And the third top concerns, the privacy concerns with online communication. With the pandemic, that pretty much everything overnight had to move to the work from home or the digital platform or the communication went digital. In that uh, in that era, the privacy concerns was the biggest uh, you know concerns for uh, chief compliance officers. Now, top compliance challenge. As I said, there are many, but we basically focused only on the three. This is basically going to be a what you call a post COVID-19 or, or the, you know, once the COVID-19 era is over, when you gradually move to what you call back to the what it used to be a early 2020 or late 2019 type of setup. The regulatory concerns, you know, regulatory compliance uh, is basically 63% of you said that there's a basically a, what you call a challenge. Roughly around 50%, there's a change in the internal policy. We all know that it has to be a, a change in the internal policy given the structure uh, or structural shift we had from the economy perspective, the technology and the digital framework because of the COVID-19. And the third, of course, is the impact of that is the 41% of the chief compliance officers says the technology is a top, uh, top uh, what you call compliance challenge, basically fitting technology into the various stream of operation within the compliance framework or within the company is what you call a challenge. Now, what is the impact of COVID-19? Uh, if you look at, you know, you know I, was, I was talking about this aspect earlier in the opening slide and in the, I mean, I was touched based about this one. The pandemic is a, in fact a very good opportunity for bad actors to exploit the vulnerability uh, we have or the vulnerable businesses through a variety of means from you know identity theft to cyber crime and that's basically prevalent and then in, in fact most of you have expressed those concerns uh, during the survey roughly around 40 percent of chief compliance officers said that increase in the misconduct fraud acts of bribery among the third parties and the eco entire ecosystem or ecosystem partners, one hand vendor, another hand customer. 14% of you said roughly, you know, every second uh, CCO surveyed. 62% uh, of you said that amending internal compliance policies in line with work from home model is basically what is called uh, impact of uh, COVID-19. And more than 54% can say that credit limit of both suppliers and own businesses has been impacted. And that's a reality because uh, pandemic has impacted everything. One point of time, something around 75% of the businesses on this planet were impacted. Now that's gone, gone down, but during the second wave, third wave in the most of countries, our assessment indicate that, you know, most of the impacted businesses in terms of the lockdown or lockdown related, measures got impacted in and that's resultant on that's going to result on the bankruptcy that's going to result on in terms of the higher credit limit payment default and in fact you have to keep engagement going on so that's uh, reflecting the third impact of the covid 19. now moving on to what you call the usage the second item you know usage of the online tools to vet your third parties we all know that uh, you know when you are using the technology, when you are using a platform, when you are using uh, what you call uh, uh, any tool, any technology, the processes of waiting any third party, or what you call the due diligence or the scrutiny, uh, is very smooth, and there is a lot of benefit. In spite of the fact, there is a huge opportunity to grow into this space because one in a four uh, chief compliance officers, 25% of you said that are uh, using online tools to vet third uh, parties. Uh, in fact, two in five CCOs who use online tools benefit from faster vetting processes. 
Two in five CCOs who use online tools benefit from the depth of the information provided by those tools. So one is a faster rating process. Second, the depth of the information provided uh, by those tools, which means using online tools to vet the third party is very important, very faster, and you get a more information about that entire ecosystem. Still only 25% people are using, which means it is a huge opportunity to grow this in uh, grow this in space. And given the fact that pandemic has changed the nature of the business, nature of the doing business across the chain, this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, area is you know, set for the improvement. And I think, you know, there's basically more and more people have said that while well, they are not using, but they are intent to use in order to stay ahead of the curve and avoid compliance, fine or compliance challenge or compliance concerns across multiple geographies, across multiple countries. Now, identify red flags. This is within the second uh, categories. Two in five businesses use thorough uh, background checks and proper due diligence to identify third party risk relationships and in house special investigation team. And we are asking third party that's very, very limited around 12, 13% people have used, but there is a significant two in five businesses. They are doing a thorough background checks, proper due diligence. They are doing that one whether they are doing themselves, whether they are doing with using third party, but they are trying to find those red flags which might create a trouble for, uh, uh, you know, trouble for the uh, our own entity or the related entity because no one wants to get into the, those challenging area or those trap of compliance related fine. And we have seen across many examples that that could lead to a serious uh, complications, serious uh, concerns around that. Now, one, you know, red flag and one concerns uh, often came out during the survey is basically ultimate beneficial owner. Two in five CCOs surveyed think it is important to know the ultimate beneficial owner of their customer, suppliers, and vendors. That's very critical. How that's work? Because I think, uh, you know, it is vital in protecting their brand reputation and ensuring they do not deal with illegitimate businesses. And that's what basically, you know, I mean, I was talking about and that's how came up. Who's the ultimate owner of that particular entity? Is it led by some of the shallow, you know, shadow company or some, you know, some, some what you call money laundering issues or something what one has to be basically aware of who's the ultimate owner of the company and that things came out loud and clear 42 percent of ccos they've said that that's the focus area for them uh, during pandemic and the post pandemic now when ownership is obscured by a layers of indirect ownership or looping ownership it should raise a red flag and that's basically a red flag we're talking about why i'm saying because five percent of the global gdp is laundered globally in a year five percent in talking about a huge sum the corrupt politicians or people use secret companies to obscure their identity in 70 percent of more than 200 cases of grand corruption globally so left hand side of the concern you can you know you see that's what's happening in those shadow company or, or you know talk about uh, you know money laundering cases that's have gone up and pandemic or related crisis are basically absolutely a very good example for this type of bad actors to uh, act uh, you know aggressively now right hand side of, of a chart you see that's a that's a basically uh, very you know very illustrative uh, stuff where the one owner have a you know stake what do you call one person stake in the company eventually that leads to the hundred percent in others so how this uh, you know how uh, the ubo that ultimate beneficial owner capture that's basically given in the right hand side of the chart and each and every component within the UBO is very important and very critical and the company should be aware of before doing the trade with those third parties or, or, or the vendor or the customer globally or within the countries. Now, what is the key takeaways 
uh, from these surveys because there were many we just basically summed up to uh, to ensure that what is the burning issue from the compliance officer perspective what they're doing and what ideally they should be doing to ensure that they are not behind the curve they are not outside they are not basically troubled with the what you call the compliance or the compliance related fine and then related activities two in three uh, chief compliance officers find economic risk to be the most challenging in the current environment and that's going to be uh, for at least 2021 for most of the part 39% of the chief compliance officers say that they have witnessed an increase in fact in fact there is a fraud there's a misconduct there's acts of bribery is happening but during the pandemic 40 percent of them have seen the increase in the traction in that you know the misconduct fraud acts of the briberies and entire ecosystems 62 percent of the you know responding companies were amending their internal compliance policies uh, in link with the work from home model so that's basically the second piece the third piece uh, the two in five chief compliance officers who use online tools to vet their third parties, they benefit from a you know, faster waiting process. Uh, another two in five CCU, they basically get a benefit in terms of the depth of the information. As I said, that most of the CCO use a thorough investigation. Some of them use digital tool and some of them use the basically manual process. But the guy, the, the people who are basically using uh, third party or technology, they're basically getting, you know, getting a benefit either through uh, what you call uh, faster uh, waiting process or depth of information. So which means the use of technology is very critical from the speed perspective. And the fourth key takeaway is the 42% of the CCOs agree that it is important to know the who's the ultimate beneficial owner of their business partner. They think this information is vital in protecting their brand reputation and ensuring that they do not dealing with illegitimate business because I think they have seen uh, the impact of dealing with the illegitimate uh, businesses across the border. Now with that, that brings to the last section of this uh, presentation or today's discussion before we move, move on the formal. Q&A session is that how DNB can help. Now we have seen that the economic crisis have gone up, the compliance related concerns have gone up and the compliance people are basically interested in using those third party uh, technology platforms to vet their processes and they want to protect their boundary. In fact, entire ecosystem from vendor to the customer where DNB can help and how DNB can uh, help uh, protect. This we have seen uh, in the earlier slide. I just basically trying to give you a better uh, a different uh, uh, perspective that how our third party risk and compliance solutions are basically will support uh, companies to 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 navigate during this crisis during the compliance issues. You know, in fact, the Dun and Bradshaw supplier management and compliance solutions leverage our best in class commercial data to help drive informed decision throughout all third party relationship life cycles. The solutions are powered by Dun & Bradshaw Data Cloud and our live business identity, which deliver deep supplier intelligence to enable ethical and responsible sourcing, avoid FCPA anti-bribery sanctions and meet know your customer and anti-money laundering regulations. Dun and Bradshaw help compliance organization identify the specific entity and its relationship, verify a set of data against their businesses, establish their, you know, what you call the ultimate beneficial ownership, and screen entities for sanction, PEPs, and reputational risk. In fact, also monitor for changes to circumstance, event, and compliance flags and especially the red flags which we were talking about earlier. Now automation of core uh, compliance monitoring enables real time to address changes or threats so that our client, including the vendor, focus on growth and strategic initiatives 
instead of doing day to day manual management of a of an entity. That's are basically a uh, four critical areas where our product helps. So as our client, our customer, in fact, uh, you know, chief compliance, uh, fraternity and the persona, they are doing the businesses. They are not getting engaged into me, you know, uh, or investing time and energy in order to protect their boundaries. For them, we are doing, we are there. Now, how this works, uh, in fact, what we call, uh, you know, DNB differentiator. There are five reasons why Dun and Bercy data is a differentiator or a different from other uh, data provider. The one is the coverage. And uh, if you look at, you know, um, Avina just touched, you know, touch based 420 million global companies, 370 million global contacts, and 37 million plus is the linkages between various companies which company related to which company globally of uh, who who is owning those entities basically it's a, it's un you know unrivaled in the extent of global company and the contact data offered that's a basically reach we have in terms of the coverage now in terms of the uh, quality match rate is important but we stand behind our match quality that gets you the right match with artificial intelligence powered identity re resolutions with 124 issues patents. That's a basically, you know, match points. So that's a basically quality uh, of point we're talking about. The completeness. The third third important areas with where we feel that we are a differentiator. Our depth of intelligence spans 2500 attributes across sales, marketing, finance, and risk use cases with unique analytics to pinpoint, pinpoint your best target, either in the company, either in the country or outside the country. So that's the first three. The fourth one is a security and the compliance. Our global privacy program ensures compliance with applicable privacy and security requirement, including CCPA, GDPR, SOC2 and others. And we have seen this and we basically we just touched touch base about that one. Now the fifth and very critical and very important is basically expertise. We have a passionate team of 110 plus quantitative analysts, 20 plus doctorate, 28 plus data advisors, scientists committed to data quality, relevance and excellence. So it's basically it's not about uh, you know, shallow research, it's a deep inside the 420 million global companies and try to understand how these linkages, how this financial parameter works and how those basically element works across various framework. And that led by such a nice, wonderful uh, team of experts who basically advise on the various uh, framework. So that that's what, uh, you know, that's the five areas where I can say that DNB is a differentiator. DNB is a different than other competitor and where we can help you uh, navigate during the pandemic time and keep you safe from the various regulatory and various compliance challenges. With that, I will, uh, you know, we'll conclude our uh, today's presentation and thank you for uh, being with us and we are open for any questions. Uh, anything if you have to me and to 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 uh, ask, please ask. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Uh, Anna, Anna. So, sorry, I cut you out in the beginning, I guess. Uh, but, uh, I don't know if there are any questions or comments. Um, you are requested to put your question in the Q and A box uh, that is right on your screen. Arun, the first question is not really related to this, uh, but you know, it's one of the client who is asking something on the economy. I'm just reading it out for you. Uh, the pace at which the inoculation is happening is very slow and due to which unemployment rate both in urban and rural area is going to be at much elevated level till at least the end of FY22. In turn, this is going to affect the economy more deeply. What is your suggestion for business to manage this risk? 
So, so I think that's a uh, yeah, that's a de uh, that's a demand risk. And uh, you know, I was saying that during first wave, seventy five percent of the businesses across globe was put uh, under the lockdown, and they were literally doing nothing. Uh, that data varied from some of the countries to 100% and some of the countries remain at 20%. Basically, uh, the countries who recovered faster have shown the larger uh, development path. The countries who basically gone, gone through the second and third wave have they prolonged the recovery phase. Now, from an economic perspective, we were expecting that double digit growth rate in 2022. Uh, sorry, financial year 2022, which means March ending March 2022. But now that we have basically downgraded to single digit of something around 8% or so something on a top of 7 minus 7% 7 reduction in this year. So you can understand that we are not even achieving 2019 level in 2022. The idea earlier was that by 2022, at least we will achieve, uh, achieve the 20, uh, 2019 level, which means in terms of the per capita income, we are two years down, which is going to be having a, you know, a, to have a resultant impact. Now, the, in this time um, of a basically crisis, only two things come very, very, very uh, uh, active support. One, the optimism level and the recovery uh, a path businesses are basically focusing on. Basically, uh, you know, the same optimism of green shoot were visible before the pandemic start because 2018 and 19 was not a good era from the economic development perspective. But December 2019 or January 2022, 2020 was a green shoot sign. That green shoot is basically uh, likely to come up or maybe should be there to ensure that the businesses are recovering. The second, the, all those government measures and the support system they have created during last year, some of them carried forward, some of them need to be basically taking care of, especially in the MSME space. I think government is working with the talking about the moratorium, talking about the support ecosystem, the finance front. That has to be done in order to protect uh, what you call a recovery phase, because I think export and then global growth will take a time. It's basically the domestic investment and dom domestic consumption has to be picking up first ahead of the global growth story. And their government, as well as the corporate sector themselves is going to play a big role. Uh, when we basically start unlock, uh, unlock, you know, um, unlocking the uh, economic activity that started. So it is going to take a time. No, I mean, it's not, it's no easy fix that we all know. Uh, earlier, we thought that by now economy will be back to the where it, it, it used to be pre pandemic, but I think that growth phase has been pushed by the couple of quarters, but that eventually will be there. It just basically you have to stay on. We have to basically be a part of the game and part of the businesses and keep our uh, keep our uh, uh, what you call the, the optimism level high toward the investment and consumption. That's the only thing we can say apart from the government contribution. Um, Avinash, there's a question for you. Uh, what are your views on the impact of rapidly evolving technology landscape on compliance teams? I think uh, I mean, we touched upon it in passing, you know, in our in our comments as well. So, you no, know, I think uh, uh, you know what what's going to change, what's going to demand that change is what we were talking about in terms of you know getting things right, getting things right the first time around getting things done quickly, uh, which is really what the business is going to uh, demand of you. Um, I gave the, the you know, very basic example of the vaccine, which uh, the previous question also touched upon the general economic environment. I mean, the vaccine is needed, it's needed urgently. You know, how do you kind of build out a, rapidly build out a distribution network around that? With all the checks and balances, you know, which large players, and especially something like a vaccine or the pharmaceutical sector demands. So I think uh, as we were saying, you know, that having access uh, to good quality updated data, having the technology tools to, you know, uh, pull that data, analyze that data and get very uh, reliable takeaways from the data will be most important. Uh, 
So I think from a compliance point of view, and Arun touched upon the UBO, the PEP, the sanctions, and all the implications of not getting that right are very clear to you know most players, you know, most large banks, as you know, some large corporates have had very uh, severe restrictions on their business, which really hurts more than the maybe even the fines. The fines are huge, but the restrictions on business and the restrictions on management are really very, very um, tiresome from a corporate strategy point of view. So I think all of that is going to drive the uh, compliance teams to become aware of that, become much more agile and be reflective of what the business demands because nothing can work in isolation. And I think technology and delivery of that will really change that. So at the same time, there is a humongous challenge and a task. There's a huge responsibility among the hundred other things compliance has to do. Uh, but equally, hopefully, we hope that technology and the tools will make it uh, at least partially easier for them to help businesses continue to work seamlessly and prosper and grow. Uh, there's a question coming on how DNB can help. So the question is, is it primary or secondary data with which DNB can help organization? And what are the leg regulatory challenges from whom you know you can help the company? <coughs> Whom bit I did not understand, Arun. Did you understand that? Whom can we? Sorry, say that again, Naina. So they're saying that what are the regulatory challenge uh, challenges that you know, and what are the kind of companies that you can help from to manage those regulatory challenge? How DNB can help? So I, I think from our from uh, I think you know what we were talking about in our study uh, and the types of clients we work with. So in the Indian context, for example, you know. Uh, We've been here for 26 years and we have approximately around you know, 5,000 clients in the Indian marketplace who we are helping with uh, lots of solutions, including many of them around compliance, around many around third party risk, many of them around onboarding. Uh, some of them are large clients, some of them are not so large. Some of them are large banks who, who also use the data and the compliance tools in terms of onboarding their clients and relationships. Equally globally, uh, as we are a global firm, we work with all the large Fortune 500 clients, and we also have a huge offering towards the SME, focused on the SME. So our clients are right across the platform. Uh, we are happy to work with uh, any, and our data is, you know, our data is a collection of, uh, I guess, many years of uh, expertise work. I don't talk about the patents. In the unique tools we have, um, uh, and we obviously are updating the data. You know, every minute effectively, as we touched upon, as things things change, they change in our database as well. So, and it's a global database. Uh, we have uh, we are because of the vast nature of the database and the data points we capture, we are able to pull out various analytics which are respond which are which are relevant to compliance but also to other parts of the business. And some of our earlier webinars touched upon uh, you know, the, the, what the needs of the possible CFO could be or the CDO could be um, equally for people on the marketing side, as we talked about in one of the webinars. So it's a whole host of solutions, but the core of it is the data. The data allows us to look at things and give you insights as to what might work, what might not work. Hope that answers you. Uh, since you touched upon other things, there's a question which came, uh, you know, which is not really for compliance, but you know, one of our clients, I think, asking us that kindly confirm your support in marketing field for manufacturing companies. So, what all can we do to help man marketing in manufacturing companies? Sure. So, uh, so uh, uh, what all can we do in the area of marketing for manufacturing companies? Is that what you're asking, Anna? Yes. Yes. So I think, you know, so thank you for the question. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, and maybe in my opening comments, I should have. So, uh, you know, 60% of our business globally is from what we call finance and risk analytics, which is providing insights on, you know, things related to credit, uh, finance, uh, onboarding, third party risk, compliance, uh, and all of that piece. 60% of our business comes from that. 40% of our business globally comes from providing sales and marketing solutions to our clients. So helping clients, uh, you know, target better, 
find more clients, uh, prospect more easily, make it e make it easy for your easy for your sales and marketing people to find clients and do things easily in the marketing process. So again, our data allows us to do that depending on what your needs are. For example, if you're a manufacturing company, um, and I can give you a live example of our. So for example, if you manufacture uh, pumps and you're looking to find new markets for your pumps, either in India or overseas, we could try to help you find new customers, new distributors, which markets to focus on based on our data. So finding using that data to find marketing solutions for manufacturing companies equally on the flip side which is something which we are also able to help large companies and this is relevant in the covid world which uh, dr arun was talking about is that a lot of companies are now looking at the supplier network and trying to figure out alternate suppliers because the suppliers haven't been able to de deliver or you know because of geopolitics many suppliers are based in countries where you are not able to so easily deal with them so a lot of large companies now want to find alternate suppliers again with our use of our data and analytics we are able to provide insights as to alternate suppliers you could possibly look at so both on the product side we are able to look at people where you can go and build new markets new relationships who should you prospect with and we are able to give you insights on them and also able to give you some in many cases contact details and things like that but equally on the flip side we can use the data to also build out your uh, supplier network better which might fit the current ecosystem arun there's a question coming from you that you know will data protection regulation like the personal data protection bill or general data protection bill gdpr limit the data we can access and compliance check I mean, is that the way the world is moving? So, uh, you know, that's that's very important and that's very, uh, you know, uh, good, good question. Thanks for this. Um, you know, in fact, data protection rules, uh, if you have to look at, it influences what data to collect, when to collect, uh, and how long to retain the data for your compliance and onboarding programs, not from collecting information you need, basically. So that's that's how we do basically, you know, what data, when, and how long we need to hold. Organization have a legitimate business use for collecting data on suppliers and new customers, meaning that compliance team are acting legitimately, you know, legitimately under data production regulation. So one side we know how to collect data and what is the basically requirement in that and the second side that what insight one can draw keeping the various law of the uh, land in in mind because i know exactly that's what i was trying to say that earlier during the various regulation your gdpr will have a different uh, ramification than the personal data protection in india and then other general data protection laws we know looking at the our almost 200 old history that how when what is basically uh, you know under the compliance rules and guidance guidance so, and, and and which means when insight are given to the companies it's a legitimately uh, compiled and com compliance team can use it legitimately that's a that's a basically safe to use but you know what i can say but thanks for that question um, an interesting question, you know, this I think this debate will go on, but you know, regulatory penalty versus cost of compliance. How important is the metrics for business? I think uh, honestly, there is no debate on that, right? I think uh, uh, as I said, you know, it's uh, obviously the regulatory penalty is one thing. The loss of uh, reputation and brand added on to that. And I think what uh, what uh, regulators i think governments have also got smarter at is that you know they say okay one is about uh, is about the fine and you know things moved on but now you kind of you know go, uh, go and kind of restrict in many cases new business as well which is a very much more stronger position to fight uh, from so earlier you know you paid a fine and as you said you maybe had an arbitrage between the fine and what you spent on compliance and you said it was OK. But in today's very interlinked world, if it's going to reduce your value, uh, you know, we, we are big uh, followers of what's happening on the whole ESG side 
and ESG scores and looking at that ecosystem, the, in, the amount of activism by the all stakeholders now makes it very more, very much more difficult to kind of make that arbitrage, I think, work in one's favor. Um, and again, how, how governments and other people, regulators are getting much more uh, diligent in terms of making sure that, you know, they are able to, uh, I guess, uh, not decide or not only fines, but also make it very difficult for you not to not to do the things which is expected of you. So with this, you know, with your answer, the next questions comes that, you know, there's a because there's a growing wave of regulation. Wouldn't this inevitably cause a drain on organizational resources and ensuring compliance? So how do an organization, you know, match that? So I think yeah, there's a fine balance, right? I think uh, and it's not only about organization, but it's also about, you know, uh, many, uh, I would say, jurisdiction and geographies as well. You, you know, you're seeing this whole, um, you know, I guess global tax and the whole tax arbitrage thing. You have companies uh, doing things in certain geographies differently. So that's, I think, the whole ecosystem is uh, is obviously uh, is obviously uh, thinking about the costs involved. And uh, but what I what I think. Uh, will happen is that there is obviously a fine balance to be had between uh, the, the weight it puts on countries where then people or businesses tend to migrate out of that and on businesses themselves before which they start feeling the, the cost and the weight of compliance is so much that you know you don't do certain businesses. And you've seen that for example, you know, in the financial banking world, you had many banks kind of move out of certain markets because the return from doing business in those markets is not worth it either because of compliance or a whole bunch of other business reasons as well. But in many cases, it's compliance. So clearly, uh, clearly, I think you know, uh, consolidation is the name of the game in some cases, and compliance is one factor which may drive that. But um, I think if you get the balance right and you are focused on it for the long term, there are only benefits to be had by all stakeholders, in my opinion. Thank you so much, Avinash. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Um, thank you, all our audience. Uh, it was really a great session today. In case you have any further question, you're requested to write to us at india at dnb.com. I repeat, india at dnb.com. We'll be happy to answer. Uh, with that, we close of the session today. Thank you, everybody, once thank again. Thank you, everybody. Be safe. Thank Take you. care. Thanks. Bye.